Today is Christ the King Sunday, and I imagine some of you earlier this year in uh, May watched the coronation of King Charles II uh, to be King of England. And you might remember the reverence and dignity afforded to that moment. The dress, the procession, the golden carriage, who was there, who was not there. In today's gospel, our King, Jesus of Nazareth, offers his final teaching before the royal procession to his throne. He tells us that his coronation, what it's going to look like in the beginning of the next chapter. So we've had these last two previous chapters, and then this one, we have these parables together. Jesus is done teaching the parables, and now he's saying, I'm going to my throne by saying this. When Jesus had finished all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days a Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up and crucified. There is his coronation announcement. Looking at today's gospel text, we have to acknowledge that we live in an age that prizes tolerance and inclusivity. The reason for pointing to this is that Jesus, at least in this parable, has nothing to do with that. The same goes for, well, the sheep are sheep and goats are goats. To heck with tolerance. You're either one or you're the other. The same goes for diversity. Goats aren't prized as much as sheep. There's no equality. I had a, I had a lot of experience with goats in the Middle East. Um, yeah, so they would be herded together with the she- goats and sheep together, and you couldn't tell them apart. I remember, I think it was, a, far- a farmer told me, I think he said if the tail sticks up, it's a goat. I don't know. Anyway, um, you couldn't hardly tell the difference, but I had a terrible, terrible run-in one time with the, a goat in Afghanistan. Um, I, I, I actually got dysentery from eating it. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't look it up right now. It'll ruin your morning, uh, but maybe later. So, it, yeah, it's terrible. In retrospect, I'm not surprised because what had happened then, I was a chaplain serving in the Army in Afghanistan, in the United States Army, and um, to build camaraderie with our Afghan partners, we would have meals. And that usually meant this gigantic silver bowl filled with rice and um, vegetables and boiled eggs, oddly enough, and then goat. Um, and I can remember there was the, the lady who had put it together. Um, I remember her staring at me. All of her teeth were gone. Um, and apparently it had nothing to do with her cooking. Anyway, um, her hands were absolutely filthy. And she reached in, submerged her hand in the community food, and pulled out a boiled egg. And you would think it was the golden egg that the goose laid. Um, and she gave it to me, and so I took it smiling and ate it. To which she smiled and nodded, so then she started giving me more handfuls of food, and more and more. And by that evening, um, as the doctor, who is my friend, you have, you have three people on the commander's staff in the army. You have the chaplain, special staff. You have the chaplain, the lawyer, and the doctor, and we're called you know, the God Squad, usually with us. But that are, are special teams. Anyway, the, um, the surgeon looked at me and he's like, he checked me, he's like, Kelly, you have dysentery. And it's going to take a few days to get rid of it. Um, it was terrible. So that was kind of a run-in I had with goats. But Jesus knows the difference between sheep and the difference between goats. There's no question about it. And thanksgiving is in order for those of us who are sheep. But there's no place for gratitude in being a goat where Jesus tells us the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's where the goats are going. They will be fully cooked. Um, It's a joke, guys. Okay. Um, that That some will be saved and some will not has consistently, though, been part of Jesus' teaching ministry. That some people will be saved and some will not. He's been saying it all along. And it shouldn't surprise us that he says it here. And yet, when we talk with people who don't know Jesus, who haven't come to know him as Lord, it's very uncomfortable. I want to give you a different perspective. Tolerance isn't always good, and diversity in itself isn't necessarily a good. If I said that I tolerate my wife, (laughs) 
Or if I looked at her in the morning and said, honey, I tolerate you. What kind of relationship would that be? Sometimes I know she's a saint because she tolerates me, but um, what would it sound like if God said that to you instead of God loves you, God tolerates you? That doesn't feel right. That doesn't sound right. Or rather than loving my kids for who they are, loving them for their diversity sounds strange and out of place. Like, Maggie, I love you for your diversity. It, it, she's not smiling now. Um, it doesn't sound right. It's strange. And God doesn't love you, as diverse as we are here, for that. He loves you for you. So it's okay to separate and make distinctions. And our natural inclination is to come to our gospel text and ask ourselves then, well, which one am I? Am I a goat or am I a sheep? Have I, and then we look at our lives and we ask ourselves, have I been out and about, such as in our text, feeding the hungry, offering drinks of water, welcoming strangers, offering clothing, visiting the sick and imprisoned? Well, as I look at my own life, I could say at different times, well, I have done those things. And you can likely say the same. However, to be honest, I have not always done it perfectly. I've not always done it when I could have done it. I've not always done it when I surely should have done it. James makes it clear that if your trust is in the law to save you, if you're ju to justify yourself before God by your good works, you have to obey that law your whole life. James writes, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. If I'm going to set my standard by what Jesus says makes a person a sheep here, by if, if doing those works is what makes them a sheep, if I read this scripture that way, well, then we're all done. We're all goats. And in fact, I'll say that more in a little bit. Everybody here began as a goat. I'll say more in a minute. And concluding whether or not you're a goat or sheep, it's about the law. Making the checklist and seeing if you measure up, as we've learned during our Roman study, it's a very un-Paul-like thing to do. It sounds more like one of the earliest heresies of the church, a heresy that continues today. It's Pelagianism. It's the pull yourself up by your bootstrap. You can make yourself good enough. Pelagius taught that original sin, in fact, did not taint our human nature, and that we humans, by divine grace, well, we can become perfect if we just try harder. This view undoes the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for us. In fact, you don't even need Jesus. You don't even need a New Testament. You just need that law and to live according to it. But the funny thing is, I think your experience will be similar to mine. I have never met a person who's perfect. Even babies, when, when we first get them, oh, they're so perfect, and we feel that way. And having baptized a whole bunch of them in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, but just wait till they start walking and talking to you. Give them time. Give them time. Yeah. Um, none of us reaches perfection. And, and if somebody thinks that they have, they're probably insufferable to be around. So what's going on? Where can we find the gospel in this text today? Can we measure ourselves as sheep or goats by this list of works? Certainly not. Do you have any reason to give thanks just now three days removed from Thanksgiving? Or do we need to try harder? One reason for Thanksgiving, at least, and the good news is this, that Jesus' final coronation hasn't happened as of yet. We're here. We're still alive on earth. He hasn't come back yet. That's actually good news for many reasons. Jesus says when the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. It's good news for those we've loved who haven't embraced God's saving grace in Jesus Christ. There is time. In fact, in our passage, Jesus uses the term will, meaning the future. He uses it nine times. Now, anytime Jesus repeats something, he's telling us, get this in your head. This day is coming. It is out on the horizon when there is a judgment. But we can be thankful now for those, again, who we love, who are not yet in the faith, that there's time. Our call is to point them to the king who loves them and gave his life for them. Our place is to serve as witnesses to the coming king. We're to announce his coronation. The king is coming. It's good to be under his rule. God uses us in different ways to bring his sheep into the fold. It's like Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Paul wrote, 
I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. For we are God's fellow workers. You have no idea how what you say and do might be reaching people with a love and knowledge of Christ. You have no idea. The only thing that can get in the way of that is giving up on them. That's the only thing. And thanks be to God that he didn't give up on you and he didn't give up on me. So what do we do with this list of works here? I mean, they're pretty good. Um, This is actually quite simple. Those who receive the grace of God are gracious people. Those who have been given the gift of faith, they become faithful people. This is what happens naturally when the Holy Spirit, often working in us despite us, draws and guides us to good works. It's, this is the nature of the parable. The sheep, a people of grace and faith, are so indwelt by the Holy Spirit that they do good works through the Spirit in them, and they don't even notice it. It's in the parable when, when they respond, the sheep respond to Jesus, when did we do these things? Well, you didn't even know you were doing it. I was at work in you through my spirit to make these things happen. And those without grace and faith didn't even know what a good work looked like. When did we see you, Jesus, naked and hungry? When did we see you? If you don't have faith, you don't see these things. So should we set ourselves to these good works? Of course we should. And particularly when sensing the leading of the Spirit within us to do these things, we ought to be doing them. Do these works save us? Absolutely not. They are simply the fruit of the Spirit and a sign of what God has done through us through the ministry of Jesus Christ our Lord. Our passage, so our passage from Ezekiel makes this a whole lot clearer. God says this through the prophets. Now, when I read this, listen to who's doing the work here. This is God speaking. I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from their countries and will bring them into their own land. I will feed them. I will feed them with good pasture. They shall lie down in good grazing land. On rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured. And I will strengthen the weak. There's not a lot of room there for you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He feeds you. He gives you rest. He strengthens you. Like your baptism, it's entirely outside of anything you do. It's the king doing it to you and for you, oftentimes despite you. That's good news. Hear this. Your salvation lies completely outside of you as a person. Listing your virtues or comparing yourself to another is an absolute waste of time And it's a form of idolatry, saying that I can do the work of God. I don't need him to do it. It's going back to the law, a law that doesn't save you, just a law that judges you. If you are unsure, if you are uncertain of your salvation, then look to the cross where Christ is and not yourself. It changes everything, knowing that you don't have to earn God's love, that he is passionately calling you and pulling you in. It changes everything. And that's good news. We have another reason to be thankful. It's from our epistle reading, which ties into this idea. There, Paul tells us that, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. In Christ, all shall be made alive. So how does Christ, coming to us from the outside, how does he make us alive? Well, one way is, and most often, it begins in our baptism as little children. As as J.D., and I'll say more about their their little boy in a bit, uh, when he brings him here, that's where his faith story, his new son's faith story will begin. It'll begin in those waters. The baptismal liturgy itself tells us this. In that liturgy, you'll hear that day when he's baptized here, in it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. 
Through it, we are made regenerate by the Holy Spirit. That's what started in that child's baptism. Yet, you see, we are all, and I said I would get to this, every single one of us here is born a goat. You don't slowly transform from going from a goat into a sheep. It's instant. It's through the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ. You go from a goat to a sheep, whether it's a baptism or the first time you heard the gospel and believed, that God gave you that faith to trust in Him, to come to Him, to rely on Him. And you have the rest of your life to have the Word of God preached to you to remind you of what you are. Sheep, even though you might feel, act, or sometimes smell like a goat. You are sheep. And though our earthly lives look a whole lot more like goats when we look in the mirror, it's through the Word and the sacraments, we are in the fold of Jesus. Through a union, again, that began a baptism or faith and continues in faith, we are at one with Jesus. We're completely connected to Him. We're in Him. Also from Paul in our epistles, he's writing about when our King, Jesus, is coronated for all the world to see. You see, his coronation began in his procession to the cross, and it will be consummated on the last day when he judges the living and the dead. We say this in our creed every Sunday. Paul tells us, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed, thanks be to God, is what? Death. He will destroy death itself. Here we have the shepherd king coming to his throne. Trailing behind him are his sheep. That's you and I. He sits on his throne to rule it all and place his sheep under God where we, God's sheep, will be at peace in the presence of the living God. That's you, that's those whom you love in the Lord who have gone to death before you. That's the saints throughout all time together before the throne of God. It's hard not to be grateful to our King when we know what He's done for us. It's hard not to be thankful when we consider what it costs the Son of God to be born a child, eternal God living among us to redeem us, and ultimately to suffer and die to secure our redemption, to make sure that that day of judgment that we are there with him. Our shepherd king is the greatest reason for thanksgiving. This is the essence of our Eucharistic liturgy. In our eight o'clock service, it's it's a little different liturgy, um, and once the celebrant, the priest gets up there and says, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We call that the Sursum Corda. Once that happens, in that service, or as it happened today at 8 o'clock, we say some form of thanks or thanksgiving ten times. Here in this service, once that happens, we say it nine times. They're more holy than us. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) That would be going back to the law. Uh, It's a little different liturgy, but same thing, nine, ten times. We say it, and I bet you never noticed that. I bet you never noticed how many times you were giving thanks to God and Christ for what he's done for you on your Sunday worship. Well, that's what sheep do. They are naturally thankful and graceful and faithful. Now you'll pay attention to it, though. That's a good thing. On this Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of our liturgical year, we thank the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man and the Son of God, And we begin our new liturgical year next Sunday with Advent as we hear again about the coming of the King as a baby, but also the returning again in glory. So let me close with this. When we learn to read the story of Jesus and to see it as a story of the love of God, not just for people, but the love of God for you, the love of God for you by your name, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, that insight produces again and again a sense of astonished gratitude which is very near the heart of the authentic Christian experience. Jesus is the King we love and serve. He is the King we're grateful for. 
And the king meets us in his word and table every Sunday. He does that to remind us what we are. We're no longer goats, we're sheep. And until our earthly death, or until the day he sits on that throne for the whole world to see, we pray to him, Son of man, come in glory. Bring your angels with you. Lord Jesus, come and sit on your glorious throne. And we, your people, all former goats, but now grateful and faithful sheep, we look forward to sitting at your feet. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.